is this? <laughs> All right, and uh, welcome to this episode of the 800s. I'm your host, Alex, and uh, co-hosting with me today is our tech guy, Alan, so he will not just be behind the scenes. Adam this week is out on paternity leave. We wish him and his newborn son and his wife the very best. <laughs> I agree, Elpac Phantom. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> um, all right. And uh, now a quick uh, word about our sponsors. Yeah, so um, you can check us out over on YouTube. Go check out our YouTube channel. We've got all sorts of cool things there. Also, please don't forget to check out a really great audiobook service called Audible. I'm sure you've heard about it. I'm sure you've wondered about getting one. And we're here to say that it's probably the best service that we've found so far. It's a great service. Go check out dmstable.com slash audible today. Also, the song you heard at the start of the uh, intro is called Fearless First, and it's by Incompetech. Go check that out at incompetech.filmmusic.io. Also, for all our Patreons uh, or patrons, uh, you can go and vote on the book we are choosing for the 31st, I believe. Right, Alex? Uh, yeah, 30, 30th. Uh, no, actually the 30th. Yep, yeah. Yep. So June... The January 30th book is up for voting. Uh, go check out that. Our Patreon uh, tiers are fairly comprehensible. So go check that out. Even our lowest tier gets to vote. All right. Now this week on the 800s, we'll be discussing Dawn by Octavia E. Butler. Dewey Decimal Designation 813.54. Published in 1987, Dawn Opens as the main protagonist, Lilith, awakens from yet another sleep that has lasted for how long? She knows not. What she does know is the world she knew ended in an apocalyptic war. She is now a captive. She is isolated. And her captors are always watching. Only this time something's different. A set of clothes is laid out for her, and she meets one of her captors face to face for the first time. An alien species that call themselves the Onkali. Are these aliens friends, foes, or something else entirely? Yeah, so um, is that how you say it? The Onkali? Did you listen to it or read it? I read it. I am guessing okay. based purely on phonetics there that it's Onkali. <laughs> yep, okay. That's kind of where I was too. Um, so what What were your first impressions of the book? Um Obviously, uh, like you said, she started out uh, waking up, uh, I think it was like the second or third awakening. On Kali. That's what, uh, sorry, uh, Alpac right. Phantom. Oh. By the way, uh, we quickly missed, uh, we just needed to go over what oh, we yeah. do for the show. Oh, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> you know, we uh, here are going to go over the book. We're going to start by... Uh, asking questions, kind of posing something to the audience. And while you give your answers, we will give our responses and then we'll pull your answers into our responses and discuss them. And if there's anything you want to contribute, please do. Uh, we do monitor the, co uh, the comments for uh, people being nice because we want to create and foster a supportive and fun environment for people, not one that, uh, discourages people from contributing so basically uh you know be nice to each other that we will try not to swear but we uh you know it's gonna happen because this is meant to be an adult show so uh, ultimately be nicer fuck off uh <laughs> all right now let's get into it alan <laughs> yes i uh i'm excited I want to talk about this book. Yeah, I, I don't blame you for jumping the gun. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. So, all right, all right. So let's let's start off with, so the main character, she wakes up, I think it's like the second or third awakening, right? And so... No, it, it's kind of implied that it happened potentially dozens of times. Okay, okay. I, I remember Because they said like over the course of that... Times. Yeah, well, they they said like over the course of the 
250 years or so that had passed, she had spent a ye- two years awake. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it was never... It, yeah, it it's kind of it's a little vague on how many times it happened, but I got the impression that it happened a bunch of times. Okay. Okay. So she says, you know, she she wakes up and she's got this like awakening sickness and then she starts getting questioned. How did how did you feel about like the incarceration bit? Well, I mean, it kind of goes along with my first impression of the book. Was It was confusing and unsettling, but I think that was very intentional, where uh, Octavia Butler wanted to put the reader in the kind of space that anybody would be in when they woke up after like something as drastic as the world ending, but all of a sudden they're waking up to they don't really know what, and for how the umpteenth time, and... It was a really creepy feeling because I was, you know, I I have a tendency to do this when I read it anyway, but I kind of put myself in the protagonist's shoes a lot, and I would have been, I think I would have handled things differently, but I definitely would have been freaked out by it. What about you? How did you feel about it? I... I was startled by how edgy it was. Um, I, you know, I felt like, okay, we're going to read this sci-fi book, right? And mm-hmm. um, a lot of sci-fi books are really around a, like, classic hero uh, that I've read anyways, where, like, the person is, like, the person's a person, right? But they rise above. And especially at the start, Lilith is just a person um and she's mm-hmm. very real uh, yeah. uh her reactions are extraordinarily real and octavia understands people she she understands how like people can react especially under like stress situations because yeah. as i was reading this i was like wow this is not this is not how i thought like the hero right is supposed Mm -hmm. to act but um you know i quickly understood that lilith is not a traditional hero um not not in the way that you know we would normally think of it anyways yeah and i think you hit the nail on the head right there is i really don't think that she was ever meant to be any sort of conquering hero she's just herself and she's a survivor she's a survivor yeah uh and she doesn't pretend to be anything more or less than that yeah i think i think um like what what you're kind of saying too like she's she's really just a protagonist at this point i'm Mm -hmm. i'm guessing based on like how this book went that this book is the is her refusal right through the hero's journey this mm-hmm. book the entire book is her refusal um and so she's been uh she's been exposed to the new world which is you know her new reality and and throughout the entire book she was always you know learn and run learn and run and um maybe maybe the next couple books uh, turn her into that hero we're talking about. But right now I think she's just a protagonist. Well, I'm not sure. Like in the hero's journey, I I don't remember refusal being like, uh, are you saying refusal to the call to adventure? Yes. Is that what yes. you're referring to? Um, yeah, to a degree, I would agree. But I would think, there's a little bit of that meeting of a mentor part part there like uh uh and let's well and and i think i think you can have you know like the normal journey through through one book but then have a larger journey you know throughout multiple books right so like like even yeah yeah, because she obviously changed in this book from Mm -hmm. 
from the person she awakened as when the book started to the person she is at the end you know she's clearly physically different she's mentally different and uh you know she's she's made some sort of change i don't know if i necessarily would call it growth but certain change well change doesn't necessarily need to be growth i mean if we right. look at what the hero's journey journey actually is she kind of goes through like a mini one but it feels like there is so much more yeah yet to happen yes. in that regard yep. because like almost all of it actually kind of happens in that first little subsection, the womb. Um, yeah. Like, uh, and I would love to hear uh, if anybody else, uh, f how far they feel uh, Lilith made it in the hero's journey. If you think it was even being followed as a structure at all, but you know, we get the call to adventures, just the being woken up, meeting a mentor is obviously meeting the Owen Kali. Uh, crossing the threshold, I think, was just touching them for the first time. Ooh, uh, trials and failures, learning to uh, accept interact, them. interact and accept with them. Growth and new skills, obviously, learning their language and other things. Okay. Death and re death and rebirth, exactly. Is the being no death and rebirth is the actual being turned into their little oh, their vessel. The revelation yeah. that. Uh, of what that actually mean potentially means, you know, and then like finalizing the changes, accepting it. The only part I don't really get is the atonement bit and the getting gift. Like a lot of, a lot of that happens like when she receives the uh, the changes. Basically, the growth, new skills through the getting a gift. That's all in the world of the unknown, and then returns changed is when she finally meets the other or starts meeting the other humans for the first time or at least reading their profiles that's return change but there is definitely something much bigger going on here yeah and that's what this book is setting up for i believe yeah personally um i am certainly intrigued to read the next couple i don't mm -hmm. know if it's going to be anytime soon but um, the setup here has been pretty good to the point where when I when I finished the book, I was ready to be like, OK, I want to know where she's going in her journey. Oh, I've already got the uh, second book. Oh, you do? <laughs> I need to dive into it as soon as we finish this. Uh, I actually started it, got about halfway, got interrupted by some stuff, and then came back to it and just reread the entire book like really? today. Today, wow, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm really ready to just dive into the next one. <laughs> you read so fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, what kinds of you like? I don't know about you, but as I was reading this, I could see how much Octavia has influenced sci-fi already uh, with uh, her work, this particular work, let alone some of her other more uh, other famous works. But this one in particular, uh, I could point to any number of TV shows, books, um, and movies that were inspired Inspired, that were clearly ins at least partially inspired by this because it, it seems a little too close to be accidental. Like the biggest one that sure. came to mind, I don't know if anybody out there is a Futurama fan like I am, but uh, Yivo from the, uh, it's the movie, uh, like the episodes that they released almost as a movie after Futurama was first canceled and came back. And Yivo is this interdimensional being that's made of a mass of tentacles that plugs itself into the back of every creature's neck and gets them to love Yivo and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, man, if it like aside from being like a single being versus many, like as as far as we know anyway, uh, and being interstellar versus interdimensional. Like there are so many weird similarities there. And it's also a lot less free will involved in uh, the Yivo storyline, but considering they pushed it into like three 20 something minute episodes. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm guessing it's a direct reference. That, oh, that it, I, it has now. to be. Futurama is known very well for referencing famous 
like actual science, uh, actual science and science fiction, like throughout history. I would not be surprised if they pulled from that. Mm-hmm. Um, what was... I also thought it was a really great portrayal of a truly alien species as much as she describes them as being bipedal and having a vague similarity to humans it they were both literally and metaphorically alien i did yeah i i felt the same way i think i think she did a really good job of of showing you how different they were by show well through the reactions lilith had right and then and Mm -hmm. then through the actions of how the other humans um, or through the other humans reactions as well. Uh, uh, you know, and they kept, kept referencing like she hated them for how they, how they looked. She, she feared, uh, she feared of them. Uh, she was disgusted by them. Um, but also to some degree, I believe she was intrigued slightly uh, she did a really good job of laying out all of these emotions and made you feel like how different they actually were. Because, I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at uh, uh, a lot of other science fiction work, um, uh, you know, even Stargate, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, let's say Stargate Atlantis. You've got the Wraith. The Wraith are scary. Like, like if you really think about that, the Wraith are freaky and they are they are pretty close to bipedal for uh or pretty close to our uh uh physiology right uh you know they're based off Mm -hmm. of all of the uh, you know they're i believe it was like changed genes or whatever but but either way like they they're really scary and they didn't Mm -hmm. react like at all to these things right and and you see that in a lot of other science fiction work but what Octavia does is just, I don't know, through through showing you how people react to these things, you start to realize how people probably will react or or might react, you know, in, in these kind of situations. Well, it's such a visceral reaction yeah. that goes to the very core of at least life on Earth, where we fear the unknown, things that are truly alien and foreign to us freak us out. And where on, you add on top of that the fact that these creatures operate through olfactory senses, which are linked, the olfactory sense is uh, linked most directly to the brain and is the hardest to control or to manage because it ha- happens instantly. We mostly associate this with memory and stuff, but uh, it can be with other things as well. It's why, like, s- like when you get a bad smell, even before you can say, oh, I know it's not anything that's in my body. Your body's reaction is to want to hurl. <laughs> like you start gagging and stuff because of smells, even if it isn't something that's actually currently harming you. And you, these, they also work on a neurochemical level. And that has to have that. We, we can't even begin to understand how we would react to something like that but we do know that when you mess with human neurochemicals in any way while we are aware of it while we're conscious of it happening even if we're not understanding that that's exactly what's going on the reaction is going to be pretty drastic and like you said you put all that together and I couldn't help but feel it a little bit myself, and I didn't even meet the things, you know. She, and and you know, it, talking about the neurochemical part, like Octavia plays in that realm a lot. Like mm-hmm. like that's that's what the oncoli on o oncoli the o oncoli uh, dabble in right is is through um, those those chemical changes, those biological changes, and yeah, I so. I'm trying to remember. I think it was Farscape, the Leviathan. Yeah, and yeah, I had the exact oh same God. thought. That was another one of the series that I was like, "This had to have been influenced," because I believe Farscape would have come out in like the '90s, I think. Uh, but yeah, the uh, Leviathan was a living ship, and it was connected to a being that was integrated into, like, directly into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, pilot. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, it was uh, released in 1999. There had to have been some influence there. Uh, it's it is animal based, whereas the Owen Collier ship is animal plant and neither is the way they describe it, I yeah. believe. I, and I, I guess the Leviathan a... can kind of be similarly described, yeah. um, but you know, there's. I have to believe there's at least some level of uh, influence there. I I certainly feel as if she's kind of the OG for a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Current current science fiction premises when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, there's just a lot of things that I, I'm like, man, that I see a lot of that now. A lot of the the bio the bioengineering the biomechanical uh aspects and stuff like that where you're replacing metal with organisms so i mean that was that was pretty cool i i really enjoyed um getting kind of schooled on on some original usage yeah and you have to also consider the fact that this being made in the late 80s what um by then human genome sequencing was pretty minimal mm -hmm. all right shut up google <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that anyway uh so the fact that she was able to extra extrapolate from that and the fact that a lot of it is more or less kind of where we started to dabble not obviously with any of the kind of control that the Owen Kali have mm -hmm. um in fact i'd love to hear from our uh, viewers like what did you think of the Owen Kali's ability to manipulate genetic material um so directly and efficiently uh or effectively and specifically that's the word i was looking for <laughs> Because if you have the ability to get into another being's DNA and change such very specific things about them, I mean, obviously this came after hundreds of years of study, but that's a pretty incredible power to have over other species. And it um, kind of makes you wonder how that evolved you know especially for a species that apparently it has been spacefaring since before the dawn of life on earth so that's billions of years yeah i i think um i really think that it comes down to uh like a peri a parasite or a symbiotic relationship honestly like i have i have this like um I have this theory that the Uloi is that is that how you say it? Um, the, 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 uh, the neutral, I, I, the sex the neutral. Yeah, yeah. The sex neutral organism. I I have a feeling that they are parasitic, and that the Oankali are uh, the the gendered sections. Just because of how different they they act, uh, and and the gene acquiring really comes from the Uloi. <laughs> the Uloi. The Uloi. Yeah. Yeah. Uloi. Yeah. I think so. Anyway, Outback Phantom, feel free to yeah hit us up. Key, uh, key us in on what the pronunciation is on that. But again, phonetically, I think we've I think Uloi is. Uh, but yeah, I I would tend to agree with Alpac Phantom. I think the timeline and layout of it kind of fits. We can't put these things into the same kind of um, structures, whether that be social or genetic. Uh, genetic, and by genetic, I mean like uh, um, sexual and how they pass on their. Um, genes and culture. Uh, I don't think we can put them into the same boxes that we're used to. Uh, in fact, there's actually a book that I read that, again, I think must have pulled from this. I read it like in 2018. I can't remember the life of me, the name of the book, but it was specifically a three gendered mm -hmm. uh, 
alien race that was taking care of humans and two of them uh the two male and female uh of the species were there for uh essentially rearing the next generation mm -hmm. whereas the third was supplying the genetic material and for any mm -hmm. creative pursuits mm -hmm. more or less i think and, i've seen that in a show once too can't yeah, think of so the show. it i don't disagree with the potential for a pair a parasitic nature but i don't mm -hmm. necessarily think that the uloi are the uh outsiders and if they are the outsiders i don't think they're the ones being taken advantage no of. so so here's here's oh, what i'm yeah. i'm saying is i think i think they the onkali are the oankali are um are still one race right like they've they've bred so much and and interbred with all these different uh genetic codes and all that stuff that they are one thing or, or, you know, splinters of a thing. But I, <clears throat> with how manipulative the, the Oloi are, I really think that, that if anything, they are the, the, uh, the thing that brought together the others. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think you're right. I think, I think, uh, we can't really think of them as traditional, like, you know, with, with, uh, male and female. Um, but at the same time, because I can't comprehend that, uh, <laughs> that's, that's where my mind goes. And, and it, it just, I don't, uh, maybe, maybe it's not that, but the Onkali have, uh, they have this, like, they have this parasitic nature. Like they are, they are manipulative, uh, thoroughly manipulative and they are they seem desperate to collect right and and they mm -hmm. even say it right like like they their their sole purpose and interest their flaw right ours is hierarchical um like structure theirs is gene acquiring yeah, uh, well, that's their drive. Right. Uh, w whether or not that's their actual flaw is uh, a bit debatable, though. I, their well, flaw seems yeah. to be, like, honestly, I, I'm not exactly sure how to describe it, but it more or less comes down to a level of arrogance or they just don't care about the... The, uh, the uh, other species beyond the trade so uh, like in that mm -hmm. respect it does become the issue uh with them is maybe they can be a bit single-minded in that pursuit um uh, but i don't think it's the acquiring itself that's the issue because i've actually seen examples of this in um i guess technically it's fantasy and it's actually a, a manga slash anime called mm -hmm. hunter hunter where there's a chimera species where these ants, anything they consume, they basically take on characteristics from whatever they consume and pass it on to the next generation. And this sounds like a much slower, more deliberate version of that happening. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and the thing is, is like their compulsion is to acquire stronger traits, the chim chimeras and this kind of, has that feel to it but again because they're doing it over the course of hundreds of years and again that could be in part because they're as far as we know uh well super long lived not quite immortal obviously because they talk about old age in it but and they see time in a different way which i also wish they would have explored a little bit more because i was a little confused by that it felt kind of like a plot filler you know, mm -hmm. like, yep. I'm not exactly sure how to, how to explain this. So, yeah, we just see time differently. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I think I think Skittles had a great comment. Like, uh, I didn't get the reference to the dangerous game, but uh, he explained it. You know, he said he said maybe they uh, started doing it and got addicted and couldn't stop. And and to some degree, I, I think uh, that's certainly plausible. 
Oh, I I think that absolutely could be like it could be like a biological component to it, but the way that they approach it now as if they are the magnanimous saviors like taking on that yes. role is something it seems like they kind of have done either to excuse what they were doing mm -hmm. on a on a moral level if they if morality even exists to them um or if it is like you said just a pure addiction because mm -hmm. the way that they manipulate the uh, brain chemistry of things is unsettling, especially yeah. for me, like with my background in psych and particularly neuropsych, like it made me physically angry yeah. <laughs> like and a little bit sick to think about like something going in and changing my chem like my brain chemistry. I was telling it no, and it says, but your body says yes. That is right. And I don't, you know, I don't use this word lightly. That's super rapey. <laughs> it is. <And laughs> I I got the same I got the same vibes from it, uh, and and I actually, uh, you know, it it made me uncomfortable. I I'm sure that this book is a trigger book for uh, uh, many victims. Um, yeah, and, I would. So not... I would actually say, you know, that should be a word of caution when you suggest the book. If you do suggest the book, is listen, Boy. this this book is uh, biologically and sexually pushy, uh, and and oh, yeah. to a point that could trigger some people. Well, and not just the alien aspect of it, but there are yes. scenes where it actually happens between humans. And I know that's meant to yes. draw out the raw nature of the way certain humans react to what is effectively our most stressful situation. Social isolation over the course of long, long periods. And uh, also got me angry how they couldn't grasp the concept that that could be like so terrible and detrimental to a species. But... Also, the fact that you're putting them in a situation where they have almost no choice but to doubt everything while being forced to accept everything. as And the number of people that can balance that in the world are fairly small. We see it when uh, Lilith finally does start creating her group is there's, what, a handful of people that she had to choose and she specifically chose them for their potential to do this um, very thing of balancing those two issues and being patient on top of all of that. Mm -hmm. And that was what maybe less than a dozen people out of 40. Yeah. And the rest of them all reacted fairly predictably. Obviously, some of them reacted much worse than others. Right. But... Right. Um, what? So let me ask this question: Out of okay. all the Awaken, who disappointed you the most? Disappointed? Yes. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I would. It's really a lot of them because of the descriptions that were given reacted the way that I more or less thought that they would. Uh, in fact, some of them actually did better than I thought they would <laughs> with it. Uh, Tate being the main example, like she did, she did try to break off at the end, and I more or less predicted that, at least to myself. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I, it's really hard because like none of them really disappointed me outright. There were just some that reacted a little bit differently than I thought, but there were some that also impressed me. Like I was impressed by um, how, again, I was impressed by how well Tate handled it without getting too terribly manipulative. Like her profile said she might. Uh, I was impressed with how well Celine held up, especially after the way that uh kurt turned into something monstrous uh and you know he he freaked out exactly the way that i thought it would and 
good. He just had to be a cop too. <laughs> right. But I think I think that's the yeah. person that disappointed me the most is Kurt. I really saw Kurt as becoming like the enforcer on Lilith's side. Like when she's going through all of the profiles and stuff, I was like, okay, he's going to be collecting up people to protect right and but i guess what i didn't see is him seeing her as a threat or or like the threat not a threat but the threat even though she called it out i really thought kurt was going to respect the authority because he has that that uh you know that police background and and he can identify and respect that authority potentially Right. And then on top of that, his his greater will is to keep the peace and to protect. Right. Like like that's what his profile kind of showed with, you know, protecting the kids and all that stuff. Well, I, I, I agree with some parts, but I disagree with a few others sure. in particular. Yes, his his primary primary directive is to protect people. That's what focuses him. But people can do some terrible things when they think they're trying to protect protect oh, other sure. people. And the other thing is, is any time that you are in a military setting, and we're learning this more and more, when you're in a police setting, you it's very easy to fall into an us versus them mentality, especially in stressful situations. And when you have an us versus them situation. The them might be the supposed aliens, but they don't trust that that's even a thing. So who is the one person who seems to have more information, more connection to this than anybody else? That's Lilith. And she becomes a lightning rod for that. And they predict this going into it, that this could be the case. And I saw that as just kind of a ticking time bomb. And the catalyst was that giant douchebag Peter couldn't get out of his own way um he kind of comes around too little too late (laughs) but uh you know more or less all of it played out kind of how i figured especially when the aliens were refusing to intercede in some very strategic ways and i don't know if that's intentional or again if it's that arrogance of we've tried this before we know better even though you're a totally different species that we're fascinated by because we don't totally understand you and you're so rare (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) like it seems a bit paradoxical and i don't know if that's meant to be a flaw built into the owen collie or if that's a flaw built in that was not really fully resolved in the book yeah i really that i think was the hardest bit for me to reconcile when i was reading this is like these aliens are billions of years old are like a species that's, that are billions of years old they have genetic memory so they don't have the excuse of we forgot this mm-hmm. uh at least not in the way that we would as humans um you know to the point of being able to quote this happened this many cycles ago or whatever <laughs> um as a part of their history mm-hmm. And there's just some things that, like, well, if you have that many lessons, the first thing you should have learned is that we can't predict everything. And yet, you know, I I get it's kind of mitigating circumstances where, yeah, you can't predict everything, so you just go with what you know works. But they didn't even seem open to trying more except that newest generation um, in – uh nikanj uh nikanji i believe is is uh there's no i it's it's just uh it's just n-i-k-a-n-j i believe unless all right all right phantom let us know (laughs) so so yeah i think so i think what you're saying though really is what solidifies uh oh by the way uh, thanks for the follow, uh, Sainted X. I, I got the notification. Thank you. Um, so I, I think what mm. what is solidifying for me that they are parasitic and potentially... We'll get into this in a little bit. Uh, but 
that they're parasitic, parasitic, and and uh, it, it, that nature is because they refuse to accept what they're observing, even though they keep saying, like, we know you, right? Like, we know how you're going to react. We we know this person isn't going to live. But they know all of these these things about us, these mental things about us, but they can't get it right. You know what I mean? They can't they can't seem to figure out how to how to get us to work together in order to further the species for both of us. Well, they do uh, just to play devil's advocate a bit. They do admit that there are some species that are just not savable because they uh, are self destructive. Yeah. Again, taking that with a grain of salt because it's coming from one of uh, the Oankali, and they might be misinterpreting it. But also, to your point, um, parasitic nature isn't to understand beyond the goal. Right. And their goal isn't necessarily to save them all. It's to save enough for the trade. So, so let me ask you this. Do you think the Onkali started the war? And I don't really. I mean, like I can see that being an interesting theory, but I, while they may be parasitic, I think they have enough of a or at least the way they describe it there's enough of a uh will stand by they probably could have done something to prevent it and very deliberately didn't <laughs> but but you what, know what proof like, do you have none but right. like i just it's kind of a feeling just based on their behavior towards the like things that have nothing to do with um uh, the war itself, uh, or even just their interactions with. Uh, I actually kind of agree with uh, okay. Ace uh, Gittle is that they were probably drawn to creatures of intelligence and potential conflict because that is a target rich environment. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they right, do they're, right. Right, they're right for saving. Uh, they That's fit fair. these criteria. Now, and well, there is a certain. Although the one thing that may lean me towards your theory, and I don't know if uh, Ace Gill or Alpac fan might agree with this, is their fast is their specific fascination with us. Was there any contact prior to the end of, the end of the world, essentially? And if there was, did that fascination lead them to take more action than they might have otherwise? Right. Like so, so here's here's the reason why I think they started the war. For one, they admit that the uh, their splitting was well overdue. So they are they are desperate. So that's mm -hmm. one, right? They also already um, are are interested in how we act, right? So they're they're interested in our acting, and if if they did have prior um, engagements, let's say Roswell, you know, and stuff like that, then they know we have a propensity for cancer. We have all sorts of interest that they biologically might want. And mm -hmm. we know that the Oankali are patient, very patient. But what they never talk about is how long have they been waiting so did they become yeah. too impatient? See, see that we might be escalating towards another world war, right? They see the uh, cyclical, um, uh, uh, you know, yes. process that we have, and mm -hmm. and we're moving towards another world war. And did they push it too far, right? Did they say, well, we know these people, and we know in a few hundred years they're going to do this already. So why not just do it now so that we can get the genes we want and we can split and we can help them sooner? Yeah, 
And that's that's kind of exactly why I'm willing to accept it as a theory. I don't really think so because I think they are more long lived than that. Plus, they seem to be super pragmatic about these things, and they talk about how basically they're not the only collective out there. Right. There are numerous yeah. ones of these, and maybe their collective was doomed to fail, and that's just kind of how it goes. Like when uh, bees will offshoot to another place to try to establish a hive for a new queen. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's what swarming actually is when it's not invoked by an outside aggressor. Okay. If you ever see bees swarming without an aggressor, it's because they are m trying to move, at okay. least temporarily. And maybe that's kind of how this is, where you know, maybe they're a bit more pragmatic about it and they don't, while they may be desperate, that is superseded by whatever their prime directive is. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that that brings up, though, is that they saw our nature and our flaw, which is that combination of two characteristics that are potentially very helpful, but not when combined. And that's we brought this. You brought this up earlier. That's the combined hierarchical hierarchical nature of our society and how it's ingrained both genetically and on a bunch of fundamental levels combined with our intelligence uh what did you and let's extend this to uh our viewers uh what did you think about that as being like our fatal flaws as a species um i think i think that um they were i think octavia had a good point i think to some degree uh the hierarchical nature causes strife right like like you you see it all the time you you see that that constant churn of society right the people mm -hmm. on top don't understand the people on the bottom so there's a coup and and so that's and and you see that in many mammals if not other uh animals you know you see it in wolves you see it in uh in primates you you see it everywhere right mm -hmm. and and yeah i i would get that that's a flaw and and i would argue that she's right i mean i mean between that flaw and being so intelligent all that is is we figured out how to make really strong bombs we figured out how to kill each other really really well and we're ready to do it right like like mm -hmm. that's that's i don't know i i agree i agree and i also agree i don't think that's the only two things but those are such huge components and i think that was a really amazing insight that struck me to my core and i spent like i i spent i don't know probably an hour just thinking about that very concept and one of the things that the Owen Kali actually mentioned is we are intelligent enough to make the facts fit uh, to make the uh what we observe fit what we want right and that and when you combine that with a hierarchical hierarchical nature which they said can be adaptive and it is adaptive in things like again for decent reference bees there is a very strict hierarchy but there's an acceptance of that hierarchy at the very core of their nature and we're intelligent enough not to necessarily accept that and when you combine those two they fight each other and you com and you add in the ability to find ways to be self-destructive whether that be passively through resource consumption or actively through weapon production it winds up being potentially fatal and yeah there are there is this kind of cycle of um coups when the top doesn't pay attention to the bottom but we always settle back into that hierarchy like that's just within humans let alone when you look at our um related like species related to us mm -hmm. and well, I would I would argue we crave it, right? Like like when someone says I crave structure, mm -hmm. what do you what do, what are they craving? They're they're craving that that sense of of uh, organization and and hierarchical nature, right? You well, want, and that's why you want it to be fights. in charge, or you want someone to be in charge, and you want either of those people to be uh, competent, right? 
Well, yeah, but that's also fought by the intelligence oh, part. Oh, absolutely. As, as well, because, you know, yeah, you want somebody to, like, there are plenty of people who want that, but there's plenty of people who don't as well. Or the people or that who will abuse Or will use the attention, uh, the um, intelligence to abuse that hierarchy. And the thing is, it's like, you don't necessarily need a hierarchy to have order, though, or structure, like that's a very human way of thinking is that the structure has to be hierarchical. Why can't it be lateral? Like the Oan Kali essential, uh, well, ostensibly are anyway, as far as we know it's, but it can, again, it can fight the, uh, the hierarchy can fight the intelligence thing because the, what hierarchy allows you to do is it allows you to shut off, having to think about certain things because some certain things are how they are mm-hmm. and that's very easy it can be very comforting but then you start to struggle against it when it doesn't fit other things that you want and you're smart enough to realize that it doesn't fit those things and do something about it mm-hmm. uh uh a skill asks are there any lateral structures in real life um i I don't know for sure. I what would be a lateral structure like the Owen Collies networking? Well, a, a lateral structure I would think would be kind of fungi. Okay. There's no real hierarchy to it. There's certain different types that like uh, what is it like? One of the biggest organisms in the entire world by mass is a giant fungi, and it com- it has different parts that serve different purposes. There's no hierarchy to it. They just serve different purposes. Huh. And um, while there is no intelligence factor in that <laughs> that we know of anyway, um, there. That that is what I would be would consider like a lateral like everything serves okay. a purpose so there's order but it is not necessarily hierarchical hierarchical no one thing is above like the outright other. it is outright above the other correct sure. okay um so yeah that's the closest I could come to that uh, if anybody else has any other examples <laughs> please feel free um to chime in on that one uh but uh hopefully that answers your question a skittle because i am <laughs> not entirely sure if it did <laughs> all right yeah. so i'm glad it came up with something because yeah. apparently the uh a skittle is drawing a blank too for a bit there um hmm. all right so but, how did oh, go ahead. so how did you how did you feel about the loss of Joseph? That one actually hit pretty hard. I think part of it though is because I identified pretty heavily with him. Um, because I think in a lot of ways that's probably how I would have reacted if I would have been. Um, uh awoken at that particular point in time um and i I, there's some things i wouldn't have done quite the same i probably would have accepted certain things just because i wouldn't have been able to change them i'm not sure i would have had the drive to do whatever they kept alluding to him having something else going on in his head yeah Uh, uh they talk about the learn and run but there seemed like there was something more, something a bit more vindictive to it with him. Joseph and was that's... originally an actor, right? Mm, was he? Or was that uh, Gabriel? Uh, I thought that was uh, Gabriel. But, okay. Um... I couldn't remember which one it was. Because, I mean, if, if it was Joseph being the actor, it would kind of make sense because... I mean, I like you were saying. I don't feel like Joseph at any time was ne- was one hundred percent real. You know what I mean? Like, was I think he spoke some truth, but I think he lied to Lilith many times by omission. Right? You can see that in him not telling her about uh, the about the danger to him, and he only talked mm-hmm. to her about her danger. Right? And and that comes up 
a few other times. Yeah. By the way, uh, Joseph uh, was the engineer who lost his wife and was oh, going to attempt right. suicide after the uh, yep. after he'd been captured, or at least he implied that he would. Yep. Yep. Uh, That's right. You know. So, I mean. And I would like to pose this question again to our uh, viewers is how do you think you would have handled being awakened, whether it was as one of the group or if you were in Lilith's position and would you have a preference for one or the other? You know, um, personally, I found uh, like aside from certain aspects of it initially, I probably would have rather have been in Lilith's position because my curiosity would have gotten the better of me in a lot of this where again i i would have you know i would have freaked out about certain things but like eventually would have come to the conclusion i can't change these certain things so let's go along with the things that i can do I don't know what I would have done with it or that I would have reacted the same way, but I would have rather been woken up first and had this opportunity to see more of the reality of things, I guess, or at least the ones presented by the Onkali, uh, just to get to know them, because I had a deeply morbid fascination with how they did things, or morbid might not be the correct term. Maybe uh, the only other word coming to my head is perverse, and that's probably wrong too. But <laughs> I like, get what you're getting at. Though. I just, They're I just had a deep curiosity them. about their culture, the way they do things, because yeah. it is so foreign and so alien that I just wanted to know more. Plus, it combines a small dream of mine to just, you know, be in space <laughs> <laughs> and like discover something new yeah. and previously undiscovered by humans. And she's discovering it in a way that the only people who knew about it were people who had accepted staying there. Yeah. So so let's say you couldn't choose to be woken first or part of the group. If you were woken as part of the group, what side would you have fallen on? Would you have... Lilith, uh, absolutely. You, Lilith, yeah. Yeah, because tr like, trying to resist something that you have no idea what, if it's, uh, what is going on, um, you're given a certain level of facts and I would have remained skeptical. And again, this is why I connected with Joseph mm -hmm. is I would have absolutely remain skeptical, but what the hell am I going to do about it? Right. Like I'm going to go with these facts as they're presented to me, keep my eyes and ear, uh, keep my eyes open and ear to the ground for something different or something that doesn't smell right. I'm bringing in all the senses here. Yeah. <laughs> Ace Skittle 2 says he would have gone with Lilith. What about yeah. you, Alan? I I would have went with Lilith, um, mainly because I am, uh, I am very mutable. Um, so I I forget what the personality is, but I take in information and change my ideas frequently. So I change my viewpoint based on so. the the information given to me. Uh, You're adaptable. Often, uh, sure. If you want to call it that, I, I find well, it to that's be the same quality that Joseph had was his adaptability to a situation based on the information. I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, a lot of times I feel like it's a flaw, but I, I think in this situation I would have accepted the information given to me. I would have adapted it to my current train of thought. Um, and whatever that might be at that time and would have linked up with Lilith um, because of of the concept of everything that I know is true until proven not true, right? Like like anything's mm -hmm. possible. We're, we're put in this box. Um, and what does it matter if we are on Earth or not? We've all been in the solitary confinement for ridiculous amounts of time. And we all know we can't get out. So, yeah, and it's not doing anything that you can see to right. like outright harm you. Right. Yep. You know, like that'd be one thing, but uh, I think a will hit the nail on the head. Open-mindedness is another key part to adaptability yep. in that respect. And having those two things combined is what would allow you to wind up, uh, 
And uh, Ace Kittle also, you know, like he said, he'd be on Lewis. I assume that he has uh, similar uh, thoughts on the matter based on his comment of being open-minded. I so uh, so to to play on your question though, what do you have stayed in camp? So you know how you, like so they went to oh, the jungle. What I have stayed yeah. in camp. So once once they learned, you know the the on uh, Owen Kali. Uh, said, you know, we knew you guys were going to move out into the jungle, uh, you know, test your skills and eventually come back or group together as a community. And then we'd have to collect you up and get you, you know, down to earth because you're ready. Do you do you believe that you would ever have left camp? Um, Actually, I probably would have just to explore for exploring sake because like worst thing I come back. Right. Like, especially given that information that, like, that river runs up against the edge of the um, training room, mm -hmm. is like, worst case, I find a wall. <laughs> like, it's not that big of a deal. And I trust, at least personally, I trust my survival skills enough that I would be able to make it back. Um, you I know. Go ahead. I, I probably would have left, but with a very similar mentality to Lilith's. Where I would just be like, yeah, if there's something out there, great. If not, like I'm not expecting anything, and then we just kind of come back. Plus, I don't think I would have connected as well with the people who probably would have stayed. Really, uh, the closest okay. I might. Well, I mean, because you're uh, saying you're saying that you would be in Lilith's camp, but Lilith had no propensity to leave. Yeah, she did when the right when the other people wanted to. And again, you have to remember those people that she most connected with, mm -hmm. including the person that um, that uh, uh, Nikanj said she like had basically answered all the questions as similar to uh, in um, Joseph. He decided to go because they're operating without the kind of connection and context that she has. Mm -hmm. If I had that connect, if I had that context that she had not knowing any of that other than her word, mm -hmm. I would be like, Oh, I'm just going to go see for myself. Worst case, I'll come back. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't, well, I mean, it, really wouldn't hurt me especially if i had the knowledge of the fact that like we're in a spaceship where somebody who literally touching the ground was healed um <laughs> right uh you know but the people who stayed back behind were people who ha either hadn't chosen a side or were leaning towards peter and kurt's side and just hadn't left yet just either hadn't left or didn't have it in them to leave. Sure. I think, um, I think that's and, like the core yeah. reason why I never would have been woken up. I don't, I don't believe I would have been awakened. I think, I think so. Like my, my propensity would be to stay in camp and try to build up what we have. Right. Mm -hmm. So they said, you know, your supplies are going to run out. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. let's let's ration supplies and start generating, uh, uh, you know that that supply like income, right? And let's let's work on building up the land around us. We've got a good foundation. Why would we restart out there, right? And and so it, it for me it wouldn't have mattered whether we were on a ship or not, because we had a good foundation, and um, uh, so why not, right? I, I, I sure would explore, but I would treat it just like, uh, I don't know, like a vacation's a terrible word for it, right? Because it's not actually a vacation, but I would, I would, uh, I would salt, I would sate that curiosity, but I wouldn't go for extended periods. It wouldn't be for, for weeks or months. It would be like, I want to see how far I can go in a couple days and come back. And well, that's it. Like a camping trip. Ace Kittle brought up exactly what that is, is it's scouting. And a lot of, yeah. and most societies have some level of that that goes on when you're creating any sort of, um, uh, well, sedentary or agricultural society. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that isn't based entirely on hunter-gatherer um, 
tactics. And the thing is, it's like, I, I honestly think those qualities probably would have gotten you woken up. In fact, you probably would have been one of the f- like first people woken up. Oh, thanks, <laughs> like, dude, you, you would like, be the first well, person woken up. Well, I mean, <laughs> this is, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but you're compliant enough that you're not going to start an uprising. You're uh, resourceful enough that you're going to work with, be able to work with in the means that you're given. And you would be able to explore in a healthy way that brings you back to the Oan Colony. In fact, that sort of thing, if you if you had the capacity to... Um, or the assess capacity to teach in the way that they want, like Lilith, honestly, you probably would have been more likely to have been chosen in a Lilith type position, if anything, because nice. if you can teach other people to think the same way, but that takes a certain kind of skill that I'm not sure, like it's so sure. rare that people have what it takes to like actually make that work. Right. Uh, because it takes a certain level of strength, an ability to stand up to certain things. Right. Like uh, that's why Joseph was given that uh, little gift of his mm-hmm. is he was willing is because he was willing to say no put gift. you know endure something. What's the other thing is they apparently consider not pleasure as pain almost because where they said okay. he was willing to put himself through any kind of pain to or endure any pain to get through uh, to get to a goal and. To that, and the only thing he had endured to that point was he had endured them trying to incite neurochemical pleasure in him, and he was resisting it. Yeah, like, (laughs) um, it. I mean, that might be a bit extreme, but so I thought that was a weird little perception. Uh, difference that I think again makes the Oankali so uniquely alien. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask one last question from me, and then you can ask a question, and then we'll get into the end game. So, okay. uh, uh, <clears throat> what do you think? What do you think the Lilith in the Oankali should do next? For the next batch uh to to get that community sense that they're looking for i don't know that there's going to be a next batch i think this batch is set and they're going to earth oh they for sure are going to earth but but like i don't end, think there's Lilith... going to be a next batch for them though that's the thing well is... that's that's what they said that's no. like the last couple pages is about lilith uh starting a new batch that's that's why they won't let her go to earth maybe i misread that then hold on a second um it says that that i thought they were talking about the owen collie starting the next batch not with lilith though and they were keeping her because of the child gestating in her not because of the batch i don't think so i i think i I think that was the point of keeping her and the point of impregnating her. So mm. so regardless, regardless, let's say they do awaken another batch and and they have a shot to uh to fix um what they would have what they did wrong in in the first batch. What would you have done to to help create that like not us versus them mentality, but like this community mentality that uh, kind of started acceptance. Um, I would have probably prioritized who I would have um, awakened differently (laughs) to begin with. I mean, Tate was a solid choice and so was Joseph I would never have opened up the Pandora's box that was Kurt as soon as she did. I would be looking for people who – I would be looking for three things. I would be looking pr- to prioritize intelligence and adaptability, which which she did. Secondary, compliance, and uh, nurturing. Uh, two separate qualities, ideally combined, but 
um, nurturing in particular, and throughout all of this, a level of loyalty, which I know she was looking at, but she started getting into the protective nature too soon. And again, we don't know all the profiles in right. there because what she had like 80 to pick from yeah. or something like that. And I, I think she jumped the ball a little bit because she was just eager to be with people. And I think now that she's been around people, she can make more level headed decisions sure. <laughs> because like what with Joseph, she was just like, Oh, it's like taking everything in my power not to. And then the next person she meets that even remotely sounds like him, you're awake. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think with that out of the way, that alone is enough, um, you know, to start making better decisions on how you just structure it because she did the right thing saying, saying the truth. They were technically captive. I am human. I am in contact with them. Their goal is to get us back to earth and we can, and according to them, we get back to earth by at the very least pretending this is a ship. Like, even if you don't believe it here, you know, so here's the things you do and things will change. If it doesn't change, then we can freak the fuck out, you know, yep. you know, you know, save the freaking out for if the plan doesn't go as said, you know, in the meantime, you know, I would be looking for people who have experience in, uh, you know, dealing with people as another, you know, kind of like hierarchy uh, not hierarchy but like a, a priority um for uh, qualities that i would look for is just people skills in general mm -hmm. because some of the people that she picked out like i was a, a little surprised at how well gabriel worked out like him freaking out the way he did was understandable i was just surprised he wasn't more manipulative i didn't like him <laughs> i didn't like the character I mean, I thought he was fairly smarmy, but like, like that's kind of what I'd expect. I didn't, I didn't outright hate him. I didn't like him either. I was just surprised that he wasn't more uh, a jerk. But more, yeah. I, well, I'm surprised he didn't wind up being more of that Peter type sure. of character, just smarter about it. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing he was. I mean, at the end, he became the alpha, right? Yeah. I mean. At the very end, I'm just surprised but, it didn't happen sooner, sure. that it wasn't more deliberate. And, you know, so, yeah, that's how I'd go about it. What kinds of changes would you have made? I, I think that she awakened people too slowly. I, I personally think that she, um, she should have done the, a mass awakening. And I understand why she did it the first time. I don't think that it would go necessarily as bad as she thought it would. So I think I think a mass awakening and um, and I think either her powers removed or get real edgy and give powers to everybody else. So like eidetic memories. Well, the eidetic memory, maybe, but the biggest thing is you'd have to be able to convince Theo and Kali to do that. And they seem right. so resistant to doing that with anybody who hasn't proven themselves. Right. But, I mean, uh, one of one of the key features uh, in the downfall was the differences, right? Mm -hmm. Was she wasn't them, which created, like you said, this, this, this very quick... Uh, uh, latching on to us versus them mentality. Well, even without the physical differences in strength and such, yeah, the information different, uh, differential that and her ability to contact them and the things that they had to give her. Well, that's one thing I think they could have given them all that could have that from the out start would have been you know as you waken them after their first sleep there you give them the power to open up the food stores yeah yeah <laughs> like absolutely um 
Well, and you can gauge their reactions, you know, who's okay. going to be, uh, you know, what, just based on power of food. Mm -hmm. Well, some people, yeah, you, there's a lot you could learn from that. Mm -hmm. I, the, I just don't know what logistically would be an issue there because they were apparently able to go in at night and sneakily heal Peter's arm yeah. when they when they were asked to. What's to stop them from giving them access to the food? It's not like right. and it, it's when it's very deliberately stated that you can have access to food without having access to the rest of the ship. Right. Also, I don't know what else there might be like that they can't differentiate. Like maybe they would have the power to awaken people accidentally. Like because well, in, think, in think a of this way, she's given eighty profiles and only wakes up forty ish. Right. Like, would they be able to, like, although, no, you're right. They would have to have the picture. Right. They had to have something to imagine. Yep. I think yeah. I think the other thing, my my final thing about it would be uh, group exercise, whether it's yoga, tai chi, you know, something, something like that, because <clears throat> group exercises and games, because when you've got idle hands, she found out quickly that she needed to start waking up more people because people needed people to work on. But, you know, if you give people things to do, whether it's exercise or gaming, uh, you are going to create a cohesive nature between people and you are going to give them, you know, something to do. That's and... assuming that they're going to submit to the authority. Plus, uh, the disorientation that comes with being reawakened maybe after time i think that would be a good idea but if you do the mass awakening mm -hmm. like i don't know i see that being a little chaotic i would have done it faster certainly but i would have started out with like a group of five and then just start doubling until i sure. had my number sure and, and that's um, true i so i i just said mass awakening mainly because you get a lot of chaos all at once and then it settles like like you you find a a settling being able ground. to guide it well that's Especially. is is that the right thing to do right like like if you're if you're guiding it that sets you apart lilith well, lilith was set as being the alpha but should she have been right like like not not saying that she doesn't deserve it but like the the Onkali have this idea of like the linear uh, uh, layout. So why not try to adapt something similar or at least allow things to fall naturally instead of Lila saying, I woke you up, so I'm in charge of you. Well, I did, that is one thing. I would have probably eased back on the I'm in charge of you part, but I would have said, sure. but the thing is, is like to get out of there, they have to accomplish certain goals. So there has to be some Ooh, guiding yeah. hand there, and that they're not. The and games it can't in. be the aliens because of how much we freak out around them, yeah. like just the physical reaction of it. So I I do agree with faster. I don't agree with completely sure. like mass chaos because. There does have to be some guiding if you're going to get to the goal that gets you out. I'm, I'm probably and, wrong. Yeah. So anyway, um, I think what uh, I'll try and make my question fairly quick. Okay. Then um, we didn't really cover this, but Lilith talks a lot about how freaked out she is about what the hybrid alien yeah. human babies are going to be like. Yep. <clears throat> like. I don't know why, but if they have that level of genetic ma manipulation, what do you think they're actually going to look like? Because they could ostensibly make these things look essentially human with just different character, with just like some specific yeah. characteristics. Or are they going to be born separately? Because the Owen Kali have one baby and Lilith has one. So is one going to be like, you know, looks alien, has a couple human characteristics. The other one is looks human, is going to have a couple alien characteristics. You know, like if they have that level of control, I don't understand why she's why they can't describe what this is going to look like. Yeah, I so that's that's one thing I found or I I find will be probably uh, telling 
right? Is 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 Lelis baby different than uh, I forget the the female's name? It starts with an A, I think. Um, but will the babies be different? I think that I think it would be wise if the uh, the progeny are more similar to humans. The reason being is humans will be more accepting of the young. Uh, with that, the Oankali really don't care. They they are above that, but the humans are not. Um, so yeah, I agree. I I would I would almost imagine something identical to humans. Um, you know, with with some hidden traits after metamorphosis. So like the traits, the physical traits come out after metamorphosis, and metamorphosis happens well after they are uh, of rearing age. You know, they're past past the time of being a child. Uh, See, I think it's going to depend on the true nature of the Owen Kali right. as to what ends up happening. Yep. Because for my, uh, for you know. If it's symbiotic, then it should be dimorphic, where mostly alien looking, but has the added traits, the added human traits and the altered alien traits for the alien birth, mm -hmm. the Onkali birth. And then, like you said, mostly human with just these few extra alien traits, like the extended life and stuff uh, for the human births. Mm -hmm. But this is, and this is another reason why I think they might be slightly parasitic. The way they treat sex, in that they have to be involved. Yep. Because yep. they can ostensibly change the stuff after conception. Yep. But they have to be involved in it. Leads me to believe it's parasitic. It's going to be mostly alien, or you know. And that's uh, again. I'm going to bring up those chimera ant uh, from that hunter hunter manga. Is uh, they are going to they are consumers that call it trading, and they do some trading. Mm -hmm. You know, and the trading the trading word specifically is the only thing that makes me think it might not be entirely parasitic. Uh -huh. I forget, you know, but it's certainly not like there's a third version of it where it's basically the complete opposite of a parasite. Uh, it's not symbiotic. Um, Probably something uh, like asymbiotic. Uh, <laughs> you just put the the a part in front of it. Oh, uh, there's. I, I I just don't see them being symbiotic. Oh, um, let's see. I don't I don't personally believe that's what they're doing. I I agree with Lilith. I think what they believe they are doing with enhancing the human race will commensalism. That's the word. What is it? Uh, commensalism. It's a symbiotic relationship in which one species benefits while the other is not affected at all. Yeah, I. So it's not the opposite. It's just like lacking one characteristic, and I don't. I don't um, think humans are going to be humans. You know when when uh, uh, Lilith's kid come out comes out. Obviously, because they have genetic material that isn't human. But I think that the Owen Kali are not careful is the wrong word but they don't w tread they're lightly. they're not concerned yeah they they don't tread lightly they are doing what's best or what they feel is best right yeah so and all right yeah, yeah. So, so i'm glad we got to touch on that because yeah. i touched on another bit that i wanted to talk about that i wanted to talk about is just you know uh genetically speaking like yeah. genetically speaking are they taking over or are they yeah um you know, personally, I think it's going to be uh, slightly more. It is technically symbiotic, but it is going to be slightly more parasitic because I think the humanity is going to effectively be bred out. Yes. Yep. I agree. So um, or at least that's what they're going to try to do. And I don't know how much trial and error they need on this, but it seems to be implied that they need gen. a little bit. I don't. I don't think it's going to be much. So uh, let's let's get down to brass tacks here. Okay. Would you recommend the book and why? 
Um, I would definitely recommend it with you know the trigger warning exceptions. Uh, you know, depending on people who have an issue with that, because this, you know, we didn't talk about it all that much, but this book is fairly hyper sexual in a way that is very foreign and like you have to really think about it it's not like oh there is a sex scene i can more or less ignore this no you're talking about an alien creature that more or less absorbs one in another and then impregnates one without their knowledge or under consent. a utilitarian or reasoning it was a utilitarian reasoning for it and they said that they can say no but in the past they haven't exactly paid attention to no right so again I, I'd recommend it because there's some amazing stuff in there and it's very thought provoking and there it's going to make it's almost certain to make you at least a little uncomfortable and I kind of like that because it's forcing you to really get into like the depths of like how would you react in the situation and the way it's described is so real and relate relatable and um it uh a skittle brings up a very good point uh, he said he would uh, definitely recommend it and that octavia did a good job sticking to details and keeping away from bland assumptions of details the assumptions of details thing is a big deal yeah um it you know she went with realism and you may not agree with every detail but she didn't assume a lot of things and she forces you to check your assumptions right and again that's how you get really into this and how you can really delve into the human nature. So yes, I'd recommend it. What about you, Alan? I would recommend it. Uh, just like you said, um, there's clearly, you need to call out the, uh, the trigger warnings. Um, but barring that, I think it is certainly something that you need to read. If you are a science fiction enthusiast, um, oh, yeah, or, for sure. or anyone that has a, a affinity or propensity to read uh science fiction or the like um it's it's great i i really enjoyed it it was thought provoking did i think that um did i think it had like the normal feeling of completion no um but i i am driven to read the next book so that says something mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I felt the same way. Like I said, I've already got the second book and I'm ready to dive in. So uh, on that note, if you have read the next books or if you have more comments, feel free to hit us up and get in on our Discord server. Uh, we would love to have anybody in there who's willing to participate in our uh, very awesome, very uh, mostly nerdy uh, community. Uh, Again, we'd love to hear from you. Just uh, hit us up and we'll get you a link and uh, Alan will tell you where you can hit us up. Yeah, so you can hit us up uh, through direct message or DM us uh, on Twitter at DMs Table or on Facebook at The DMs Table. Uh, you can also check out our uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash DMs Table. That's where you'll be able to vote. You'll get exclusive access to our Patreon only section in our discord um it's yeah it, it's it's a great time over on discord so we highly recommend that people come join us and join the fantastic community um yeah i i also check out dm's table we've got a uh, cool side projects or other projects that we do one of them is a DD podcast called roll with advantage um so go check them out. It is on pretty much every podcast directory uh, that's out there. All right. And, uh, well, uh, just to get us started in on the upcoming months, again, we have Black History Month coming up in February and Women's Month coming up in March. If you have any suggestions for these books, please let us know. Again, best ways to hit us up are on uh, uh, to get our Discord from us or hit us up at at the DMs table at Facebook or at DMs table on Twitter. Uh, just let us know if you have suggestions. We'd love to have them. Uh, and to that point, we have a winner of this uh, this week's uh, um, vote, Yeah, correct? the book vote, yes. So yeah. uh, 
the book we will be reading uh, for January 30th is The Blacksmith's Son. The Blacksmith's Son. Yep, Who's that by, by? Michael Manning. All right. Blacksmith's Son by yep. Michael Manning. Oh, and a quick shout out to my friend Colleen, who's the one who recommended uh, Dawn by Octavia Butler. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to Blacksmith's Son will be the end of this month. And our next one is a monster call. So get to read. And, yeah. you know, people. Uh, and, that stream is, I believe, the 16th. Yes, 16th. Yep. All right. Uh, so, um, again, join us on Patreon. Uh, we've got the Black History Month vote coming up. Uh, the books are out there. Should I read the books, Alex? I've got the I've got the book names here. Do you want me yeah, to read uh, them? Yeah, definitely. We have, we have our okay. first round, but there will be another round, so there yes. are still time for suggestions. But our first round, Alan will give to you. Yes. So, what's up for vote right now is Black Leopard Red Wolf by Marlon James, The Travelers by Regina Porter, and Gingerbread by Helen. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yummy. I will put that in chat because I super butchered that. What bam. I think it's Oh yeah, yummy. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that was that was a tough name to say. I feel super bad. No, uh, I don't even think I pronounced it correctly, but uh, and we apologize to the author yes. on that. Yes. Uh, feel free to correct us. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah, if we ever hear from an author, that's like one of our dreams come yeah, true on this great. show. That'd be great. Uh, speaking of dreams come true, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank we you appreciate to the new all followers. your patronage. And uh, thank you, Alan, for stepping in and stepping up. You did a great job thank tonight. You. Let's everybody give him a round of applause. I'll be back. I'll mess up things for another round. I'll be back for a monster's call. So if you didn't like me, I'm going to piss you off next the next time, too. <laughs> yeah, and if he makes you really angry, you can tell on Discord. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you just got to reach out first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, looking forward to a monster calls, and we will see you on the 16th. Yep. All right. See ya. Everybody have a great week.